Hi everybody, my name is Logan Lebanoff and I'm presenting Pixel Recurrent Neural Networks. I don't know why it won't go on to the next slide. Okay. So first, I'm going to go over a comparison of Pixel RNN to other generative models recently. Then I'm going to go over how an image is generated using Pixel RNN. Then I'll go over each of the four models that are presented in this paper. And then finally, the results. So there are three image generation approaches that are really popular right now. The first one being variational autoencoders, which use a latent vector Z to encode and decode the images. So VAEs are good at efficient inference, which just means they generate images quickly and efficiently. Unfortunately, the generated samples end up being blurrier than other models. Next is generative adversarial networks, which I'm sure we're all familiar with by now. Um, they use an adversarial loss to train their models. GANs generate sharper images than VAEs, and they don't need any kind of approximation, which is good. But they're hard to optimize because uh, they're unstable training dynamics created by the adversarial nature. Lastly, there's autoregressive models, which Pixel, CNN, Pixel RNN is one of those, an autoregressive model. So they directly model the distribution of pixels. So this makes it simple and has a stable training process. And this also gives the best test set results on log likelihood. Unfortunately, it makes it relatively inefficient when doing generation. It, it takes a long time to generate an image. So now I'll go over how Pixel RNN works um, as an overview. So Pixel RNN treats an image as a sequence of pixels going row by row. So where each pixel is dependent on the previous pixels that have been generated already. So formally, they represent the probability of an image X as the product of conditional probabilities for each pixel, where the probability of pixel XI is represented as the probability conditioned on all the previous pixels. So now I'll go over how an image is generated using pixel RNNs. So first we sample the first pixel, X1. We send it through the RNN as input, and this will generate, it'll predict the next pixel, pixel two. Then we send pixel through two back through the generator to generate pixel three. And we keep doing this until we generate the whole image. So the pixel RNN does this by having a softmax layer as its last layer. The softmax layer has 256 units, each one representing one of the possible values that a pixel can have, zero to 255. So what each value represents is the probability of generating that pixel, that pixel intensity. So here, in this example, we see that um, it's very likely to output a pixel of intensity about 100. So what the model does is chooses the maximum of this distribution and uses that value as the pixel intensity for this pixel. But we have to do this for all three channels and we have to do each one of them in order, one at a time in order. So we start off with the red channel. The pixel RNN bases its decision on all of the previously generated pixels for all three channels. So it looks at all of them and generates a softmax distribution, takes the maximum, and creates the first pixel. Now we go on to green and generate its pixel. It bases it on all previously generated pixels, including the one we just generated from red. And we do this because we want green to be dependent on the red pixel, what it's just generated. We want that dependency there. So it generates a softmax distribution and creates its pixel. Then we do the same thing for blue. It's based on all of the previously generated pixels and red and green. So here's a typical architecture used for all of the models that this paper presents. So we start off with an image, which is 
height n, width n, and then three color channels. It goes through a seven by seven convolutional layer, followed by several residual blocks, which can be convolutional layers or LSTM layers, based on what we're doing. Then we have two one by one convolutional layers, and then finally a softmax layer. The output of the softmax layer is an image of the same size as the input, but it has 256 values for each pixel, which represents the probabilities of those intensity values. Now I'll go over pixel CNN and how it generates an image. So we start off with a blank image, with one for each channel. They're all blank. The output of the model is a softmax distribution for each channel. And in between, we have several convolutional layers. So how the system works is it generates a pixel one at a time for each channel one at a time as well. So we'll zoom in on the first, on the, the red channel to see how it generates its first pixel. So first we just do a seven by seven convolution and this generates features for the first pixel for the first layer. And this is of size 128. Then we do the same thing for the next layer, a convolution. And we're only doing this for one pixel at a time. Then we do a one by one convolution for two more layers. And then finally, a softmax layer. So these 256 values make up a vector and we get the maximum. And we use that value to fill in the first pixel. So now that we've finished the first pixel for red, we go on to the first pixel for green. And we do the same thing. 7x7 seven seven convolution, but it's also dependent on the pixel that was just generated for red. So it's dependent on both of these pixels. So we generate this, the features for this pixel, and then generate the green pixel. Then we move on to blue, and it's the same, but it's dependent on all three. Now that we've finished the first pixel, we can move on to the second pixel of red. And so it generates the features for red. And we keep doing this until we finish completing the image. And we just consolidate all three channels to make one image. So as you can see, this is really slow, like really slow to do image generation. And this is because we have to wait to create, to generate pixel two, it's dependent on pixel one. It has to wait until pixel one has been generated. So it has to go one at a time. So that makes it really slow. Now, for training a pixel CNN, it's very similar, but we start with the whole image at the beginning. So the thing about this is that when we try to generate pixel two, we don't need to wait for pixel one to be generated. We already have it because it's in training. We have it. So it doesn't need to wait for pixel one to generate itself. And pixel three, similar, it doesn't need to wait for pixel one and two to be generated. It already has that information. So we can use that information to compute features for them all in parallel. We do them all at the same time, which makes it much faster to train. So something we have to be careful of, though, when we're training is we don't want to look at future pixels because we can see them, but we shouldn't use them because in the generation process, it won't have access to those future pixels. It wouldn't have generated them yet. So we use a mask over our convolutional kernel, similar to this. So it zeroes out those future pixels so we don't look at them in training. So as an example, if we're generating this image and we want to generate XI, then we apply a convolution and we also apply this, this mask to it so that we don't look at these zero pixels which are in the future and we only use these ones that are in the past. And we can apply the same mask during training so that it prevents you from looking at future pixels. So this is for the spatial layout. We need to do the same thing for each color channel because each color channel should be dependent on only the previously generated color channels that were generated. So you can see here, red is dependent on only the previous pixels, not any of the other color channels for the current pixel. Green is dependent on all the previous pixels and the red pixel that was just generated. And blue is dependent on context and red and green. So 
So an advantage to pixel CNN is that it's very simple. It's just a bunch of convolutions. And it's also the fastest to train because we can compute features all at the same time in parallel for the entire image, which is very good. Disadvantage is that it has the smallest receptive field, which means it only looks at the pixels right around the current pixel. It doesn't look at ones farther away. And so it doesn't use all of the available context. So it doesn't look at, the, it ignores these, even though these pixels have already been generated, it's not looking at them. So the reason it doesn't look because the receptive field is small. Yeah. But that can be decreased to yeah, but then you have more parameters for your convolution. Mm -hmm. Then you, if you increase the convolutional kernel, then that's more parameters. Yeah, I mean, if you, that's what you want. I mean, if you want to address that notion, then you can increase the receptive Right, but there's trade-offs to both. That's true. So this is bad, and we want to fix that. Now I'll go over RNN models that the paper presents. But first, we'll review what an RNN looks like. So it's good with sequences of data. In our case, our sequence is a sequence of pixels that makes up the image. So each of these x's is a pixel. So we'll input a pixel into here, goes through the RNN, and outputs a hidden state, a hidden state vector, which we then use that hidden state vector to generate our prediction for the pixel. Um, so what the hidden state represents, it, it represents all pixels that, are, that come before it. So H2 represents pixel X2, X1, and X0. So it like encodes all of them into this one vector. And then HT represents all of the pixels in the image. So how does an RNN generate an image? So first we sample a pixel, the first pixel. We send it through the RNN, which generates a hidden state. From the hidden state, we add on a softmax layer of 256, and then it predicts pixel two. So it generates pixel two. We send pixel two back through the RNN to generate pixel three. And we keep doing this until we've generated the entire image. And we just reshape those pixels to make up the image. So this paper uses LSTM. So we'll go over each of those equations. So first we have the input gate and then the forget gate the output gate, and the candidate state. So all four of these are gates, which just control how much information that we allow to flow to the next time step of the LSTM. So we can see that all four of these have a similar structure. They all include this xi, which just rep represents the raw pixel values for the ith time step. So this is the, the ith pixel. They also have this hidden state for the previous time step, which is shown by h i minus 1. So each of these are multiplied by a parameter matrix u and the parameter matrix w. So these are summed up and then sigmoided, or tan h. Okay. We also have two more equations, c and h, which are states. And they hold information about all the time steps up to time step i. So what this paper does is like a convolutional LSTM, if you've heard of it, then it replaces the fully connected layers with a convolutional, with a convolutional layer. So we actually consolidate all four of these equations into one equation. So it has these four outputs, one for each gate. So instead of having a fully connected layer here, we have a convolutional kernel that's convolved with the input x. And here we have a convolutional kernel convolved with the hidden state, hi minus 1. The paper keeps the states the same. Now for row LSTM. So each state in the row LSTM, each state represents an entire row. So when we compute the next state, we're actually computing the state for an entire row. And that row is dependent on the previous row's state. So we generate an entire row at a time. But we don't do this with a fully connected layer. We actually do a, a sliding convolution from the previous row to generate the current pixel. 
So there are two components in this equation. This is the, the gates equations. There's two components. There's the one that's dependent on the input and one that's dependent on the previous hidden state. So this first one, we, we call the input to state component. So they calculate this by doing a convolution with the input. So we want to generate this row of states, the third row. So we look at the same row in the image. We do a convolution, a three by one convolution from the image to generate each of these states. So that's how you generate that row. For this other component, the state to state component, we're looking at the hidden state, but the previous row. So we're looking at the second row, and we do a three by one convolution to compute each of these states. So now we can combine those two states according to the equation. We just add them, and then we do a sigmoid. So that's how we get our final state. So advantage of this approach is we can compute the state for an entire row at one time. And the reason we can do this is because we're not depending on pixels in the same row. So we don't have to wait for them to be generated. We already have the entire previous row generated, so we can compute the entire row at once. And that's good. It makes training a lot faster. But not as fast as Pixel CNN, because Pixel CNN can compute all of them, all of the pixels at once, not just one row. The disadvantage is that it has a triangular receptive field, which means when we're trying to compute this pixel, then it's dependent on a triangle above it. And this is bad because it doesn't use all of the available context. It's ignoring these off to the side, which have been generated, but it's not using it. And it should be dependent on all of those pixels. So the way they fix this is introducing a new model called diagonal by LSTM. So in the diagonal by LSTM, each state represents a diagonal of the image. So we use the previous diagonal to generate the next diagonal. And we generate an entire diagonal at a time. But again, we use a convolution to generate those. <clears throat> and this current pixel is dependent on the pixels above it and to the left of it to generate the current one. It's called a bidirectional LSTM because we do it from both directions, from the left and from the right. So we generate diagonals all at the same time, at the same time from the other direction. <coughs> so to calculate the, the state for this red pixel, we, we depend on these two. So we can do a convolution on these two. But it's hard to do this computationally. So what they do is they skew this over by one. So they shift each row by one. And now these two pixels are now uh, aligned. And so we can just do a one by two convolution to generate the red pixel. And then we'll just unskew it back whenever we're done. So we did it for this one direction. Now we need to do it for the other direction. So we skew it the other way. And now we can do a convolution of these two. However, we're using this pixel here, which is not right. It's the future pixel, so we shouldn't look at it. So how they fix this is they say they, they shift down the input map by one spot. And now they just use these two pixels to compute the hidden state for pixel, the red pixel. So now the finished state to state component is we just add up the two input maps together. So that takes into account both directions at the same time. So advantages of this is you can compute the state for an entire diagonal at once, which is fast. And it's about as fast as row LSTM, but still not as fast as pixel CNN. But now it has a global receptive field, which means it takes into account all of the available contexts. All of these pixels have been generated already, and it's using all of them, which is excellent, exactly what we want. So now I'll go over the multi-scale pixel RNN. So this is very similar to the last presentation, whenever it had a multi-scale for the generator and the discriminator. So in this thing, can you go back? So now the, the computation point of view or the 
parameters, the weights, which one has less weights, the pixel CMN or the LSTS? Less weights. Um, I mean, all of them use convolutions, so they all have kernels to compute their states. I'm not sure. I'd have to look into it. They could all be similar. I'm not sure. The, I mean, you, you know, were saying earlier that the, the Pixel one has you know, smaller. The CNN, yeah. Yeah, CNN has, has the smaller receptive fields, right? Yeah. So here, the, the receptive receptor, field is bigger. Bigger. Um, but the way it accomplishes that is mm -hmm. because of the basics of RNNs. Yeah. It, it like, it's more linear, so it just keeps the same state and it just persists mm -hmm. all along the way. Mm -hmm. it, per it persists this direction all the way until it reaches the current pixel, whereas a CNN would have to grab from all of those pixels at the same time. Mm -hmm. okay. So for multi-scale, we have two different pixel RNNs. We have a small version and a regular version of the pixel RNN. So the small one, ideally we want it to capture more global features of the image that we're going to generate. And then the, the regular pixel RNN will capture more local features. So we start off with the small pixel RNN. It generates a smaller version of the image, which is half the dimensions of the original. Then we send it through a series of deconvolutional layers to generate a bigger image, but features about the larger sized image. So this is going to be n by n by h. h is the number of features, 128 in this case. At the same time, we have our regular pixel RNN. It generates an input to state component, which is of the same dimensions as the features. And then what we do is we add those features above here. We add them to this one. Like like that. So this that that you know those features they are in the loss layer or something. Where are these features? The, the loss. The softmax. Where where is this feature Q? So yeah. this one or this one? Yeah, I mean the lower one, the the yeah, upper one. Doesn't matter because one is a smaller size. Suppose so you will have regular their own network, right? Yeah, so and it generates an image. Yeah. And then we have these separate deconvolutional layers that like upsample the the image to make it bigger, but also with more feature maps at the same time. Well, uh, okay, so that's a separate one, but then you are combining this with the regular. Yeah. Okay, so that one, the bottom one, that is like you say in the seven by seven convolution, all those things. Where is that? that just right. Just the soft mix or something. It's um. So, like before, yeah. that would take forever to go back to. Yeah. But um, yeah. like we, have, we have the first layer is a 7 by 7 convolution, mm -hmm. then yeah. a series of residual blocks. Yeah. These are the residual blocks. These come from the residual blocks. Okay. So these are LSTMs. This is the, if you look at the equation. So is it just one residual block? Or is there are several on those? Um, I assume it does this for each layer that we compute this. Yeah, go, keep going. Yeah, let's see. So this is the equation. This is the input to state component. Mm -hmm. So when we generate, so that's this one. We generate for like, yeah. if we're using rows to them, then mm -hmm. we have this one row. Yeah. And then we we have the same dimensions that was generated from the small pixel RNN. We just add them together and act like it was the original yeah. one. But it's taking into account the small pixels um, Pixel RNN's output. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe when you show that table, you can explain that where you are ending. But yeah, continue okay. your thing. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um. Okay. <coughs> so we add this one to the regular pixel RNN. And after we add it, we use this new input to state component to. Uh, we just continue the regular pixel RNN's generation process, and it'll output its image, which is of the original size n by n. But it's taken into account the small pixel RNN's output in its generation. 
So now we'll look at some results. We tested on SciFAR 10. So each of these numbers are in bits per dimension, which uh, just is a measure of the negative log likelihood of generating the test set images. So each of these numbers, um, the smaller numbers are better. <coughs> so you can see that the models generated in this paper are much better than those of previous methods. Diagonal by LSTM has the smallest, which is the best, and that's because it has the larger receptive field. It captures all everything. Row LSTM is next because it has the next largest receptive field, followed by pixel CNN, which is the simplest. So here's some examples on SciFAR 10. Um, these, these pictures are 32 by 32, which are rather small, um, but they still look pretty good. They also tested on ImageNet. Um, none of the other papers reported their results on ImageNet, so they just report their results. So we can compare ImageNet samples to SciFAR 10 samples, and I don't know if you can tell, but the ImageNet ones look better. They're less blurry, definitely, and um, they're the same size, 32 by 32. Um, but these look less blurry and more globally coherent. Um, and they suggest that it's because ImageNet has more training samples. So now we can compare regular pixel RNN to the multi-scale version. And again, the multi-scale version looks a lot better. Like, the global coherence is, is definitely better, whereas here there's there's kind of just a lot of random stuff going on. These look, look they just look better. And that just proves that the multi-scale paradigm helps with the global coherence. Another cool thing we can do with pixel RNNs is to complete images that are occluded. Because it comes naturally whenever you model the direct distributions of each pixel. So here are some occluded images. And when we send them through our model, it outputs these. They actually look pretty good um, and very varied. So they have different results. And it looks like they complete textures well, grass and trees, snow, water. And here are the originals for reference. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you. So, um, oh, the table. You had you one, uh, one slide. Yeah, I can show that. Yeah, can you show that? I want to understand. Okay. That how do you get this different resolution? It's not here. It's up here. So um, so this is showing the architectures for each of the three models. So Pixel CNN, it starts off with a 7 by 7 convolutions, followed by several 3 by 3 convolutions. Then we have two 1 by 1 convolution layers with ReLU activation. And finally, the 256 softmax layer. So row LSTM has the same 7x7 seven seven convolutional mask as its first layer. Then several, row, several LSTM layers, and they each have their own input-to-state component and state-to-state -state component, where the input-to-state component does a 3x1 convolution for that row, and the state-to-state -state also has a 3x1 convolution on the states. So that's where you add that. That's where. So it's this input-to-state component. Mm -hmm. You add. The, the small pixel RNNs output to this input to state, and then you add each of these together, and you just continue the regular uh, row LSTM. Yeah. Okay, any question? 